So what we're going to do today is talk about three different tools that I hope will get you thinking like a TOKer. Let me very briefly state what the task of the TOK course is. You've got eight different areas of knowledge, approximately like subject areas, and what you're asked to do is to compare and contrast how we come to know things in those different areas of knowledge. And then the IB lists eight different ways that you can come to know things. And that, in a nutshell, is the TOK course. Now, a very important tool for being able to do that is conceptual analysis. Conceptual analysis is something that we do quite naturally. It's really just about defining terms. However, I find it very useful to use a Venn diagram to kind of go through the different alternatives. It kind of organizes my thinking. So let's say I've got a very, maybe kind of a dull question. Do scientists use their imagination? And I've got two circles here, one representing science, one representing the imagination. So I can arrange these in different ways, just like I can in a Venn diagram. And I can take, say, imagination and put it inside of science, which is to say that all imagination is in science. Now, there's probably some people in the arts that would disagree with that. So I don't think that's a good choice. Now, we might go the other way and put the science circle inside the imagination circle, which is to say that all of science is imagination, which would almost be saying that everything is imagination. Now, that certainly doesn't sit with my usual definition of imagination. So I don't think that's true. I could go this way and say that scientists never use their imagination, but I want to test that with an example, and I want to come up with an example where I think a scientist uses their imagination. And usually when we want to test an example, we come up with something extreme. And so when I start thinking about if I put the two ideas together, imagination and science, I come up with ideas like wormholes. A scientist is studying wormholes. Is that going to involve the imagination? Now, certainly wormholes involve a lot of the things that we associate with imagination. That would be, it's a very visual picture. It has a speculative element to it. It's used in science fiction. So thinking about wormholes is certainly going to involve the imagination. However, you might argue against that and say, well, that's really done by a futurist. It might be done by a scientist, but not while they're doing science. So that imaginative work isn't really part of science. And it doesn't really matter which argument you take. What's important in TOK is that you come up with good examples to support your argument. And I would also say that it's important to show an awareness of the counter arguments. So let's say I choose to say that Scientists sometimes use their imagination, and that would be this Venn diagram here. So I would have clear examples in here of scientists that aren't using their imagination. A strong example might be somebody who is making a certain measurement and following an exact procedure to make that measurement. Out here, we would have all the examples of people in the arts, for instance, using their imagination. And then in here, we might have examples like people doing speculative work on wormholes, or maybe people involved in technology where they're using their imagination to design things that will be used in the future. So even though that previous example was kind of trivial and seemed kind of boring on the surface, once we got into the examples and we could see kind of the counter arguments and the arguments, and we were trying to figure out exactly what is imagination and what is science, it began to become interesting. So this skill of being able to sort out the alternative viewpoints and then being able to support your own viewpoint with well-chosen examples, that is the heart of the TOK course. And if you can master that skill, you're going to do very, very well. Let me introduce a second tool. And that tool is simply to be able to map absolutely anything onto a map of everything. And we're going to have a very simple map of everything. It's going to start out with a division and we're going to divide everything in the universe up into that which is matter, that which is in the external world, things that we can be objective about, that we can measure quantitatively. All of that stuff goes on the right-hand side. Now, on the left-hand side, it's all the internal stuff, stuff of the mind, stuff that we are subjective about, stuff that's qualitative in nature. And to illustrate 
how important this division between subjective and objective is, especially when we're trying to classify subject matter, I dug out an old map that I made in my first or second year of teaching. And what you can notice here is that I started with these objective subjects. I started with physics and chemistry, etc. And if I move around clockwise through the social and the philosophical, and then I end up in the arts, then I end up in the very subjective realm. So when we're talking about areas of knowledge, this division between objective and subjective is going to be very, very important. So my first division, very, very simple between internal and external. My second division is going to break the map of everything up into four quadrants. And the two rows are going to represent the singular and the plural. So if this internal quadrant, I can call it the I quadrant because it's about the internal of an individual in the singular. This quadrant below, it's going to be the we quadrant because it's going to be talking about the internal life of a society, that is the culture and the shared values within that society. Now we could also talk about a fourth quadrant here. It would be the its quadrant. For the most part, it's not all that productive for us in TLK. I've seen situations where it really works well, but I'm not going to use it much. So in the end, remember, we've got these three quadrants. And I'm going to like to call them the it quadrant, the I quadrant, and the we quadrant. And this one here, I'm going to kind of ignore. And one other thing that I want to add to our map of everything. In the last video, I talked about how we could do a map of everything where matter was in the center. And then that new emergent property, that higher order property of aliveness would go in the next circle up, and then the next emergent property or higher order would be consciousness, and then self-awareness, and then maybe even higher orders beyond that all the way to God. But the basic idea was that as you headed away from the origin, you were always heading towards higher orders. And I'd like to keep that idea in my map of everything. So heading back to the map of everything, what we're going to do as we move away from the origin we're going to represent things as being of a higher order. And let's give credit where credit is due. A lot of the ideas that I'm sharing with you are coming from a book called The Marriage of Sense and Soul by Ken Wilber. Wilber, a very provocative author, and I really enjoy a lot of his stuff. Okay, let's try to map something onto our map of everything. I'm going to start with the triune brain because I think it's kind of an interesting example. And in the triune brain, we can think of it on the external level as a hunk of matter. And there'd be an internal part to that hunk of matter, which we'd usually call the brain stem or the reptile brain. And it would have evolved first. It would be responsible largely for the automatic bodily processes that keep the body going and for basic survival instincts. Now, later on, what evolved was the limbic system. So the limbic system kind of had to operate on the reptile system. It had to kind of color all the experiences in that internal world of the reptile and to alter them. So it's really operating on a higher level. So I'm going to put it farther from the origin. So here's my limbic system right here. And the limbic system was largely responsible for social feelings, social bonding, that resulted in things like parenthood that had great survival advantages. And then the next to develop was the neocortex, which is on a higher level still because it had to operate on the limbic system and the reptile system and to organize the feelings and experiences on those systems. And it's largely responsible for abstract thinking and planning, etc. But when we're studying it in this quadrant here, we're just looking at the matter itself. Now, we can then go and say, well, what would the internal experience of a reptile brain be like? And it's a little difficult to say, but I think we've got some sense that uh, it would be about that experience of basic motion of the body. I think there's a certain robotic feel to it. And then, of course, with the fight and flight response, it would be connected to fear and aggression as basic emotions. Now, if we move on to the limbic system certainly more complicated than this, but I'm just going to write down that it's about the warm, fuzzy feelings that make us have social bonds. And then we can go on to the uh, neocortex. And of course, this is about the internal experience would be that of thinking, that of abstract thinking and planning and organizing, etc. 
that goes out here. Now if we come down to the third quadrant and try to represent this, difficult to know what the shared values be for reptiles. So I'm, I'm just going to write down here the shared values within that culture. And so I'm, so I'm really just referring to human beings. I'm not sure what the group experience would be like for animals or reptiles, etc. And I'm going to skip the fourth quadrant because I don't think it's very productive for our purposes. I'd like to introduce a third tool, and that tool is a very simple question, and that is, are we aiming towards truth, goodness, or beauty? And maybe oneness is a better word than beauty here. The question is very much taken from top-down perspective in which we attempt to achieve perfection in different realms. So we want to become perfectly truthful, perfectly beautiful, and perfectly good. Now, it doesn't matter if you don't believe that. I think the question is still going to be highly worthwhile. So if we're here in the it quadrant, and we're dealing with matter, and that's basically science stuff, so you're over here, then what is it we hope to find out about matter? We hope to find out the truth about matter. When we're dealing with matter, it's truth that kind of takes over. We want to know the scientific theories. And then on the whole, when we're over here in the internal realm, in the mind and the emotions, what we hope to achieve is sort of perfect awareness, perfect coherence, perfect oneness. And that's why so much of art is about repressed emotions and, and repressed ideas, because by bringing those repressed ideas into consciousness, we can help to make ourselves whole and one. By and large, when we're in this quadrant, we're talking about oneness, or you might say beauty. Very interesting question is, how do we know a work of art is of the highest quality? What is it that tells us that? How do we know internally that that's a really high quality work of art? And let's come down here to the quadrant which deals with cultural values and shared values, the internal life in a society. What do we want within a society? We want goodness. We want to treat each other well so that society runs well. So this quadrant here is about goodness. Now, what I'm going to do is take seven of the eight areas of knowledge and plot them on the map of everything. I'm not going to plot how we get that knowledge. I'm plotting what it is we're really after in that area of knowledge. So let's just start with the natural sciences. And in the natural sciences, that is subjects like chemistry and physics and biology, we're studying matter. And we want to know the truth about matter. And so I definitely place the natural sciences up here. If we go to the human sciences, well, there's lots of different human sciences, and I think some of them would fall in one sphere and some another. So let me take two specific examples. I'll go with psychology and sociology. By and large, I'd place psychology in the I quadrant because I think it's about studying human tendencies. An interesting question, though, is it about finding truth in human tendencies, or is it about finding oneness in human tendencies? And that's really going to result in two different branches of psychology. Sociology, I'd say by and large, looks at group tendencies, so I placed it in the we quadrant. Ethics is the rules of society so that we will treat each other better, and it belongs in the we quadrant. Now, distinguish that from morals. Morals is really like our moral compass. It's our internal sense of right and wrong, so it belongs in the I quadrant. Now, religious thought, it certainly touches the I and the we quadrant, both of them very strongly, but the approach is very, very different because in the religious thought, we're trying to find things out, assuming there is sort of a perfect higher order realm where we can get perfect information from. So it's very different in its nature. I think the arts would straddle the two subjective realms. Much art is about changing society, making society more one, but much art is about making ourselves more one. I would place history here in the we quadrant simply because we're trying to get at the truth of the events that occurred within a society. Now, whether or not we can actually do that is a big question and an interesting question. Lots of interesting questions when it comes to history. What we're going to try to do now is take our eight different ways of knowing and plot them onto our map of everything. Now, there's a sense in which this is very, very simple, 
because everything that we come to know or become, become conscious of, we can only become conscious of something in the internal realm. And that means that our eight different ways of knowing ultimately belong in this I quadrant in the top left corner. Even for something like a sense perception, which we would probably be inclined to put into the it quadrant, really belongs here. And we can see that if we think about an optical illusion, where something has an object of reality, but when it gets interpreted, the subjective reality is different from the objective reality. So what's interesting with all of these ways of knowledge isn't so much where they're placed on the map because they all get placed in the same place. What's really interesting is where is that information coming from so that it can be processed inside the internal world. So for sense perception, naturally, we're getting our information from the it world, from the world of things. And yeah, just keep in mind that, of course, we have very much extended senses. We have because we have a lot of scientific equipment, our senses have been greatly extended. And we can see a lot of things that we couldn't see with our eyes. Let's try to follow the same reasoning with the way of knowing reasoning itself. This would be good to try out with conceptual analysis and the Venn diagrams. Is reasoning simply sort of an abstract pattern recognition? Certainly one of the things that we reason with often is patterns in nature. So there are patterns in nature and we can reason about those patterns in nature and therefore build models and make predictions based on pattern recognition. But we can reason about anything. It's, it's an extremely flexible tool. We can reason about cultural values. We can reason about the higher order realms. We can look for patterns in that we can reason about unconscious processing. So it seems that we can reason about absolutely anything in our world, except that which is totally random. And that becomes an interesting thought in itself. Are there some things in the universe that are completely unknowable, that no amount of science is ever going to understand them? If we consider emotion, then emotion, like reasoning, the information can be coming from almost anywhere. We probably typically associate emotions as coming from the social realm. But sometimes we'll see something in nature that will trigger a very strong emotion. Or sometimes something from the higher levels, something, something from our relationship with God can trigger very, very strong emotions. Unconscious processing can, of course, cause very strong emotions. So emotions can come from all different places. And then it becomes a real question as to how do we know where that emotion is coming from? Is it something coming maybe as more of a reptile brain type emotion? Or is it more of a limbic system type emotion? How can we distinguish between all these types of emotion? Perhaps the most difficult way of knowing to really comprehend is language. And that's because language is kind of like the air we breathe. We don't notice it, but there's nothing more important to our being alive than air. And there's nothing more important to our understanding than language. If, for instance, Aristotle had not been a top-down thinker, Aristotle was hugely influential. If Aristotle had been more like Richard Dawkins, our ways of thinking would be very, very different. Our language would be very, very different. Think about all the roles that language plays that are so incredibly important. If we didn't have language, then we really couldn't have memories as a society. And when I say memories, I'm talking about remembering all the science that we've learned and sharing it with others. So our whole, our whole evolution as a society has really depended on language. And because language is so everywhere, I'm not going to put any arrows on this diagram. Language is kind of a different animal. I think I'm going to end the video there. I'd like to keep the video under 20 minutes. I have lots of other examples that I'd like to show you. Please, if you're interested, then please like the video and then I'll, I'll make another one. Okay, that's all for today, folks. Thank you.